Well, we are continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark and looking at the theme of the kingdom of God. And today we are going to look at what Mark has to say about the kingdom of God and what it means to follow the king. The passage we are looking at is Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20 that was just read for us. Let me pray for us as we look further at this text this morning. Let's pray. Oh God, we come to you this morning, and uh, Lord, we pray that you would just speak to us during this time through your word. Lord, um, whatever we're going through right now, um, whatever it is that we're uh, discouraged by or uh, maybe uh, just struggling with or whatever it is that we um, are experiencing right now regarding our circumstances, would you just speak to us, Lord? Meet us where we're at draw near to us in such a way that we would know you more and that we would faithfully follow you. God, by your Holy Spirit now, speak to us. and May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, have you ever received an invitation from someone that was so great that you couldn't pass up, you couldn't say no, Maybe it was a road trip with some friends, or maybe a wedding of a good friend. But maybe you've been invited to a party by some friends and you really wanted to go because you thought it'd be a good time, but you were a little nervous because you just met these friends, uh, the friends who, who invited you. Or maybe you've been invited to something that was so great that you needed to give, but you needed to give up some very important things in your life. Maybe you had uh, to say no to going skiing like you had planned in order to attend a family reunion. Or maybe it was something even more uh, costly. You had been invited to take a job that you had hoped for, but you had to move from a place that you didn't want to move from. Or vice versa, you had moved to a place that was so wonderful, but you had to give up a job that you liked or you had to leave, leave friends uh, to, in order to go take this job in another place. Today in this section of Mark's Gospel, Jesus gives, a, gives us an invitation that is so great, it is so amazing, but accepting the invitation means giving up some things that are hard to let go of. What is the invitation? And what does accepting this invitation cost us? And what does accepting the invitation mean for us? First, what is the invitation? Well, if you look with me at verses 14, we'll start with looking at verses 14 and 15. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As the Gospel of Mark opens, uh, it feels like he's in a rush. He says nothing about how Jesus was born. And then we saw last week that he is pretty brief with a huge event like Jesus' baptism. Then he uh, briefly mentions the temptation in the wilderness, which is another big, big event. And only after he rushes through these first 14 verses does he get to where he seems like he's been trying to get to all along? And that is the opening words of Jesus himself. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now we might hear uh, words like repent and believe and might think, well, that isn't an invitation. Uh, that's, That's an easy invitation to turn down. I don't like the idea of repenting. It makes me feel like I'm an awful person. But it is important here that we look at what repent and believe mean. The word repent here means to reverse course, to turn away from something that that Jesus hates and to turn to the things that he loves. And what what is one of the things that God invites us to turn to? Well, he says, repent and believe the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel, uh, the word combines the Greek word for announcing news 
And it combines it with the pre prefix, which is a prefix that means joyful. So the gospel then means joyful news. It is an announcement of something that has, been, that has happened in history, something that has been done for you, that even changes your status, the good news of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. So the essence of, the essence of Christianity is news. It isn't good advice. It isn't some tips to maybe follow. Christianity is good news, joyful news. Many religions will tell you that you have to do something to earn your way to God. Christianity says, this is what has been done for you in history. Jesus Christ lived, died, and was resurrected to earn the way to God for you. This is good news. When some say, uh, here's some good advice for you. You might feel inspired, but do you feel like there's been a great burden lifted from you? Do you feel like a huge burden has been taken off your shoulders? Something great has been done for you. The gospel tells us that you can connect with God, not on the basis of what you do, but on the basis of what he's done for you. This is the gospel. But what else? Jesus says the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is near. In the kingdom, is the kingdom uh, being near good news? And what is this, what is the good news about the kingdom being near? Well, we are told in the beginning of the, uh, the book of Genesis that God created the world in humans. And humans were in perfect relationship with God, with the king of the universe. But in Genesis 3, we see what happens when humans take things into their own hands and try to put themselves in the place of the king. Adam and Eve seek to do their own thing, to do it the way they want, and the result is devastating. Relationships are broken, and the world begins to unravel as humans become self-centered. So don't we long for restoration? Don't we long for our relationships and our world to be put back to rights? The good news of the kingdom of God is this, that Jesus is the true king who comes to put the world to rights. Mark wants his readers to know that God is doing something new, that God is on the move in bringing about his kingdom in the world, and that everything else, even really important things in our lives, pale in comparison to this news. The thing, the, the new th this new thing of the coming of the kingdom is what God's people have been waiting for. It wasn't a new piece of advice. It wasn't a new spirituality. It wasn't a new political agenda. It was news that the living God is on the move, doing something new, by coming into his kingdom. Drew G.H. Uh, Hart uh, says this about the kingdom in his book, The Trouble I've Seen. He says that the future reality has sneaked into our present concrete world. Even though we lived within the decay of this old and sinful age, the kingdom of God has come and is still coming setting things right according to God's new creation. God's kingdom is good news for those living in seemingly hopeless circumstances. Jesus rebooted humanity and creation. Jesus rebooted humanity and creation. In other words, with the coming of Jesus, God's kingdom is near, and this is good news of joy. This is good news of things being made right, and it is good news of Jesus himself. So, what is it that Jesus invites us to do? Look with me now at verses 16 through 20. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. 
And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. We see here that Jesus invites and calls four fishermen to follow him. And by extension, he invites us. He calls us to follow him. Now, does Jesus come and say, follow these principles? Or does he come and say, follow religion? No. What does he say in verse 17? He says, follow me. Christianity is about knowing and following Jesus. It is not find out more information about Jesus. The invitation is for us to get to know him. It is for us to fall in love with Jesus in such a way that everything else, all the things that we even consider so important, pale in comparison to him. So the invitation is for us to follow Jesus, to know him and to love him. But what does it cost us to follow him? For John, it cost his life. It cost him his life. We are told in verse 14 here that that this takes place after John was arrested. And he was arrested for following Jesus. And he would eventually be killed for following Jesus. But following costs other things too. The verb follow uh, here denotes Jesus' authoritative call and the disciples' commitment of entrusting themselves to him at considerable social and economic cost. And this is significant. When Jesus says to Simon and Andrew, follow me, they leave their vocation as fishermen and they follow him. When he calls James and John, they leave behind their father and friends. They leave them right there in the boat. Now these these guys would... Uh, eventually fish again, and they would relate with their family again. But what Jesus is getting at is this. Where do we go to find our identity, our priorities? Where do we go? In our culture, there are those who find their identity in their family. There are those who find their identity in their careers, or their work, or their reputation, or whatever other projects that we have. To those who find their identity in in your family, Jesus says he wants priority over your family. For some of you, saying goodbye to your family is no big deal, uh, but perhaps you find your identity in what you do as an individual. To those of you who find your identity in your work, your reputation, your stuff, Jesus says, I want priority over that too. But not only does it mean that we find our identity in Jesus. During that time, it meant, uh, during the time uh, of this passage, it meant turning away from social and political agendas which were driving Israel into a devastating war. I think a couple of uh, years ago, this didn't seem to, to, commit to, to connect with me as much. But given what is happening in 2020, politically and socially, I don't think it's a stretch to say that our polarized ideologies have driven a good portion of the population toward, uh, toward violent behavior. We are called to find our identity in Jesus, not our social and political agendas. Politics are important, and it is so important that we vote on this upcoming election, but our faith needs to drive our politics not the other way around. Furthermore, the call to repent, believe, and follow meant calling Israel back to true loyalty, to Yahweh, to their God. This is why repent and believe go together. Jesus' contemporaries trusted all kinds of things, their heritage, their land, their temple, and their laws. And even their God provided that this God did what they wanted expected him to do. Jesus was now inviting them, even calling them, to trust their God was on the move, doing something new. So what does accepting this invitation, God's calling on our life, mean for us? 
means that we find our identity not in politics, not in our social agendas, not in our family, not in our careers, our personal projects, but that we find our identity in the King whose kingdom has come near. And it also means that we trust that God has drawn near in Jesus Christ in order to do something new, to bring the kingdom, to renew the world. But one more thing. It also means that when Jesus comes into our lives and rescues us, he invites us in as participants in what he's doing in the world. It means sharing in his tasks to renew the world. This is what Jesus means by follow me and I will make you fishers of men, fishers of people. We are given the privilege of being co-laborers with the king. We are given the privilege of inviting others into our relationship with Jesus. Seeking to see our neighbors, our co-workers, and our friends find new life in Jesus. But what motivates us to follow and to participate? Why would anyone leave something they devoted their entire life to? Why follow Jesus? The passage tells us that immediately the fishermen left their nets. They immediately left their work and family. Who were these men who immediately followed? Well, fishermen in those days had economic resources and would be able to purchase a lease or rent land from Rome's agents they would, uh, that would allow them to fish. Their social ranking was very low. William Carter, in a commentary on Matthew, says this, that he says in Cicero's ranking of occupations, Owners of cultivated land appeared first, and fishermen last. He says Athanasius indicates that fishermen are on a, on a par with moneylenders and are social and, and are socially despised as greedy thieves. And yet, this Jewish rabbi, this teacher, Jesus, comes to them and invites them into a relationship. But in order to drop everything and follow, we need to see what kind of rabbi, what kind of king Jesus is. This invitation of Jesus is so unique in Jewish culture, but it shows us who he is. See, in that culture, pupils chose rabbis. That was just the cultural expectation. Rabbis did not choose pupils, students. Those who wished to learn sought out a rabbi to say, I want to study with you. Mark is showing us how radically different the authority of the king is to any other king before or after him. He is the true king that comes with humility and chooses despised sinners like the fishermen and like us. It is this king who comes graciously to invite sinners into his beautiful story. And it is this story that eventually leads Jesus to a cross on Calvary. For us, to follow is costly. But it isn't as costly for us as it was for him. He is the king who would humbly lay down his life, dying on the cross for the sins of the world, taking our punishment, in order that sinners like you and me can know God and enter in to the story of God and the renewing of the world. For these fishermen, I think it was as if they realized that the true king was so gracious and so humble that everything else, all that they had been trusting in, paled in comparison to him. Because this king came to them who were despised fishermen and not only wanted a relationship with them, but wanted them to be a part of the story of God's kingdom in the world. This is the same way he comes to us today. What an honor that he would choose us, that he would love us, that he would invite us to be with him and to give us the privilege of participating in his renewing of the world. Do you know that this is the kind of king Jesus is. He comes to us, calls us to follow him, 
and he invites us in as participants in what he is doing. Trust him. Uh, trust him, follow him, love him. Jesus has come, and he invites us to follow him, and he invites us to be a part of what he's doing in the kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that you are the true king, the true king that has come. We thank you. We pray, God, thanking you for all that you've done for us in dying for us and coming to us humbly. We pray that we'd follow after you and live for you. Thank you that we have the honor of participating with you. God, help us to live in this world uh, as followers of you. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen.